Hi everybody and happy Easter. Christ is risen. Those beautiful words that have been spoken over 2,000 years as churches have met on Easter Sundays around the world in different cultures and different contexts. And what I want to do today is look at something of the wonder that is in those words. And I'm going to do that by looking at Luke chapter 24 verse 1 to 12. But before I do that, I want to set a little bit of the scene for us. When I think of that first Easter weekend, I'm always drawn to the Saturday. And that might seem a little bit strange to you. After all, there's not much written of anything written about that Saturday. And um, it seems to be uh, forgotten in the context of the the, the brutality of Good Friday and the glory of Easter Sunday. But I think that that Saturday had a, a certain horror of its own. After the adrenaline and the violence of that Friday, the disciples on the Saturday, which is supposed to be a day of rest, are alone with their thoughts, having to process what had happened. The great expectations and hopes that they had have been unequivocally crushed under a Roman heel. And those hopes and the expectations have been replaced with fear, anxiety, despair. The one that they had been counting on, this Jesus, who had stirred up so much in them, got them to believe again, and given them such hope, had been humiliated and brutally killed on a cross. Now for us, the cross has become very sanitized. We put it on jewelry, it's in an ornamented form in, in, in churches, but it wasn't always like that. It was the worst form of punishment that the Roman Empire could subject a criminal or one of its enemies to. In fact, historians say that there was no death more painful and contemptible than crucifixion. We, the word excruciating comes from the, the process of killing somebody on a cross. In fact, excruciate can literally be translated the overwhelming and intense pain of the cross. But it was not just the awful pain, it was the humiliation that was involved in the process, being uh, nailed naked to a piece of wood. It was intended as a sign that the person was being crushed and defeated. It was a sign that uh, it was futile to challenge Rome at all. It was a a symbol that this person uh, that was dying on the cross was in fact cursed. It shouldn't surprise us then that it took so long for the church to accept the cross as a symbol that it wanted to associate with. Such was the shame that was associated with crucifixion. The other thing was that they now, the, the disciples on that Saturday must have been aware that they risked the same fate as this Jesus. The knock on the door where they're going to hear the, the sound of, of soldiers uh, marching outside and taking them off to be crucified as well. The fear that that must have uh, been rising up in them as a result of that. And then there was their failure, processing their failure on that Saturday. You know, uh, all but one of the disciples that we're aware of uh, deserted Jesus at his crucifixion, deserted him at his time of need and greatest vulnerability, and no more so than Peter, you know, Peter was, the, was supposed to be the strong one and he kind of boasted about how good he was and how strong he was going to be and how he would never leave. And yet at the moment when he was tested, he was proved that he wasn't as strong as he thought. And the one who had loved him, this Jesus who had loved him and, and, and got him to believe again, um, he deserted him at that time. And there was nowhere for Peter to go to say sorry. Nowhere for Peter to go and explain himself. There was no way he could do things again. Um, He was just on that Saturday, alone with his failure and no way to change it. That was the thing about the events on the Friday. The crucifixion and everything that went with it is so terribly final. You know, all the brutal theater of a crucifixion is there to demonstrate that there's just no second chance. There's no way we can know what Peter and the disciples were thinking at this time. We can't go into their heads, if you like. 
But I don't think anyone would doubt that it must have been a very dark space for them as they were processing what had happened. You see, where do you go when you have no hope? Where do you go when you have no hope? And here are these disciples and these followers of Jesus, and there is nothing they can do to change their circumstances. There is, there is nothing they can do to, to change the reality of where they are. Nothing they can do to go and, and uh, uh, you know, change the events of Friday or change the way they act. They are just left in this place of despair and fear. So turn with me to Luke chapter 24, verses 1 to 12. And I'm going to read from the NET. Now on the first day of the week, at early dawn, the woman went to the tomb, taking the aromatic spices they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about, them, about this, suddenly two men stood beside them in dazzling attire. The women were terribly frightened and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has been raised. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise again. Then the woman remembered his words. And when they returned from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of Jesus, and the other woman with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed like pure nonsense to them, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb. He bent down and saw only the strips of linen cloth. Then he went home wondering what had happened. And one can only imagine what that conversation must have been like as those women entered the space where the, the disciples were and the followers of Jesus and, and shared what they had seen and, and what they had heard and, and the atmosphere in the room as they were trying to process this. We are told that most of the disciples just dismissed this as nonsense. And, and that's because it sounded like complete nonsense to them. I mean, they would have known what crucifixion was all about. They would have seen people crucified. They would have seen the horror of it. And they would have known that nobody comes back from that. They would have, they would have known what it means to be dead and buried. And who comes back from the dead? Who, who comes back to life from those moments? It would have sounded like nonsense. And to believe that Jesus had, had risen from the dead, would have caused them and would, would mean that they would have to reevaluate everything. Just like it means that for us, we believe that Jesus has been risen from, has, has risen from the dead. It causes us to equally have to reevaluate everything. Jesus is now no longer just a good man who did some amazing miracles. He's no longer just some kind of nonviolent revolutionary. If Jesus rose from the dead, then his words are not just words. And his actions, not just actions. And, and his life is not just a life. And his death, not just some ancient tragedy. It means that Jesus is now no longer just, not just one among many, but he is unique. Unlike any other. It would also cause those disciples to have to reevaluate what they understood about the power and the might of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire, which just seemed like this, this incredible um, empire of power and dominance and control, which had uh, full of the, 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 the schemings of man, which had brought it together. It seemed, it, would have, it seemed undefeatable. But suddenly, when Jesus rises from the dead, if he has risen from the dead, then maybe the Roman Empire is not as powerful as they thought. That there is one who is stronger, greater than the empire's best efforts to humiliate and destroy. And therefore, there is one greater than any of humanity's best efforts to dominate, control and assume power through force, ideologies or manipulation. It would cause them to have to even see death in a new light. Death which seems so final and comes to everybody to pauper and to king, this, 
relentless hunter of humanity could not overcome this Jesus. There was one who was even stronger than the grave. See, the resurrection of Jesus changes everything. And it forces us to look at Jesus, this world that we live in, ourselves and the future in a completely different light. It's no small thing, this resurrection. And no wonder the disciples, uh, so many of the disciples heard this news and thought, this is nonsense, can it be? Because if it is true, the whole world has been turned upside down. But it's not just that the resurrection challenges us and causes us to reevaluate things. It also gives us hope where there is no hope. Suddenly, the tragic and awful events of Friday are, are, are totally changed as a result of the light of Easter Sunday. They look completely different, totally reinterpreted because of the Sunday. And one of the parts of this reading that I find most moving is that of Peter. And it says that when all the others have, have kind of saying, this is nonsense or can it be, he just gets up and he runs to the tomb. The one who is most, who's failed most spectacularly, maybe carrying the guilt and the shame, he, he runs to this tomb in, in the hope that maybe a glimmer of hope that, 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 that things will be different. And he runs to this tomb. And when Peter gets to the tomb, it says at the end of this reading today that he leaves wondering what has happened. What does this all mean? Now in the days and the weeks ahead, he will see the risen Jesus. He will touch him. He will speak to him. He'll embrace him. He he will eat with him. He will will hear his words. He'll be encouraged. And in in the months and the years ahead, he will begin to understand just the depth and the wonder of what this resurrection means, the, the impact on everything. And, and, and he will grow in understanding of this. And this man who, who slunk away in the darkness at the moment of his testing would eventually himself be crucified as a result of witnessing about this risen Jesus. How transforming in his life. How transforming. But on that first Sunday, All of that was in the future. And it's unlikely that Peter could have understood everything that was about to take place. Everything, understand what he was seeing and understand what he was hearing. Now, obviously, we cannot know exactly what Peter was thinking. But I want to suggest that as as he left that tomb, there was suddenly hope where there had been no hope. He may not have understood all the theological implications, but there was suddenly hope. And that's what the resurrection does. It gives us hope. The empty tomb and the message that the woman had brought meant that maybe, incredibly, against all odds, the tragedy, the brokenness, the failure, and the utter defeat of the previous days was not the final word. There was a light that was now shining where there had been absolute darkness. And that is the powerful indeed incredible message of the resurrection. That when we look at this world around us, we can look at this world and we can get despondent. We can see crises and things going wrong. We can can see injustice. The resurrection reminds us that that is not the final word. There is hope. We can go through our lives and experience tragedy and trauma and we can have struggles. The resurrection reminds us that as bad as those things are and as real as those things are, that that's not the final word. We can struggle and we can wrestle with sin and we can feel shame and guilt about things, but that's not the final word. The resurrection says that there is, there is a light that shines in the darkness, even in our darkest moments. There is a sure hope. There is one who is greater than, then all of that, greater than the chaos, greater than injustice, greater than the trauma and the tragedy of our lives, greater than the sin and the shame and the guilt, and his name is Jesus. And he is called the Word of God, the Word of God. And on that Sunday morning, Jesus demonstrates that he is greater than all the sin, shame, and guilt of ours that he carried on the cross. 
that he is greater than the evil of men that placed him to try to destroy him on that cross. He is greater than all the schemes of the enemy that tried to crush him and that he is even greater than death itself. And suddenly, what seemed impossible is now possible. What seemed that the, 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 the defeat of death and the defeat of the enemy, which seemed impossible, is now possible. What seemed impossible to redeem, what seemed impossible to restore, what seemed impossible to forgive, can now, is, is now possible to do that. And when we put our trust in Jesus, we share in this victory. We share in his indestructible life. We share in an indestructible and real hope. And even when the road gets rocky and sometimes the path gets crooked, we still can be certain about the outcome. We have a hope that cannot fade. On that, on that Sunday morning, Peter runs to the tomb. He runs to the tomb to find hope. And he finds hope there. A hope indescribable which changes everything. Where are you searching for hope today? Where are you searching for hope today? This Easter story tells us that there is a hope that is found in Jesus which is greater than we can even begin to imagine. That there is a hope in him where there seems to be no hope at all. That in him, suddenly, where things were impossible, things are now possible. Why? Because Christ is risen.